Well,、uh, as Jordan sort of intimated, everyone knows Naval, <laughs> serial entrepreneur, longtime investor,、uh, disruptor, trying to shake up the way that、uh, startups are funded and tech talent is hired.、Um, Naval, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me, and、uh, thanks especially for using a 15-year-old photo that makes me look really good. <laughs> You've not aged at all. In <laughs> fact, you just came back from a team-building trip in Mexico. Yeah, we took the whole company. It was an offsite. We look very refreshed and well. Yes, well, everyone was very happy. <laughs> <laughs>、um, well, even while you were away, you managed to make some news. So, for years, Angelist has allowed people to syndicate deals. Angel investors、yeah. pull their money with a broader base of investors and, and invest in startups on a deal by deal basis. But you introduced a new wrinkle on that yesterday. Yeah, we, ba we basically rolled out funds, small funds for angel investors, and this may not seem. That big of a deal because venture funds have been around for a long time. But what we've done is just like with syndicates, we shrunk the SPV down, the special purpose vehicle that people use for big later stage deals. We shrunk it down. We made it cheap and easy,、uh, and democratized it. We're now doing the same for for venture funds. So the old model was if you wanted to be in the VC business, it was kind of a 10 year hazing ritual. You'd have to go join a VC firm, work your way up to the ranks.、Uh, now with AngelList, you can run a few syndicates. You build up your track record. As soon as you have that, we put a small fund in your hands, half a million dollars, million dollar fund,、uh, and then you write checks out of that. If it does well, you come back. We refill it. We keep giving you larger and larger funds. And you sort of put a kind of like a time parameter on this, which I thought was interesting. I mean, ideally, they're going to be investing these. Funds over six to twelve month period. Is that correct? Yeah, these are short lived funds、uh, that are small and allow、uh, backers and limited partners to kind of try out the new venture capitalist, the budding VC or the、mm -hmm. budding angel,、uh, and commit to them as their track record builds up. But it's not open to absolutely everybody at this point, or is it? No, these are sort of the most proven people on the platform.、Uh, we actually raised、uh, a, a specific fund called Maiden Lane Ventures,、uh, the second Maiden Lane Ventures fund,、uh, which was raised by Accomplice Ventures, which is a really great VC firm out of Boston that's been very active on our platform.、Uh, and Accomplice raised this 35 million dollar fund, essentially creating and putting. Uh, dozens of new small venture capitalists in business.、Okay. Um, so this is a model to sort of vet, train,、uh, and、uh, scale up venture capital.、Uh, and, and really, what's happening is, I think, if you step back for a second, the industry is just getting much, much larger. These conferences are getting larger. The number of startups is getting larger. More and more people are getting into entrepreneurship.、Uh, there need to be more investors to fund those people too. And you want. Investors who are right size for these companies,、uh, smaller investors, more like angels, founders backing founders, entrepreneurs backing entrepreneurs.、Uh, many entrepreneurs here, many entrepreneurs, for example, in the Y Combinator network,、uh, are always writing each other checks.、Mm -hmm. uh, the first ten thousand, the first twenty-five thousand dollars, often comes from another entrepreneur,、uh, and you want to work with those people. Those are the friendliest people. They have the most relevant and current advice to give. They can make customer introductions and so on. So we're sort of scaling that out by providing those early entrepreneurs also with some investment. Capital to make early stage decision,、uh, make early stage investments. That's great.、Um, so I don't know if all traditional VC firms would agree with you that there needs to be more capital in、yeah. the market, but there are four that are involved in this、uh, effort. Yeah, there's actually five. There's、okay. four that we're naming right now because the fifth one's still putting the details together. But、okay. uh, Accomplice is sort of the biggest one with、uh, Maiden Lane Two. They've got 35 million dedicated to backing dozens of these operator angels.、Uh, also,、uh, Foundation Capital. Uh, Bain Capital, Crosslink Capital are all doing it.、Uh, we also have more; those are more VCs. We also have more traditional LPs, limited partners、uh, like CSC, Upshot, funds that we have on our platform, and of course, the thousands of accredited investors and family offices that are active on Angelist are also going to be investing in these little funds. Okay, I want to talk to you a little bit about CSC in a bit, but、uh, what do they get out of this? Is it just sort of a, you know a way to sort of experiment with this new model, or will they get、uh, proprietary deal flow? Yeah, it's not really proprietary deal flow, but it's just、uh, network and access. So traditionally, venture capital you build a network by coffee meetings, by conferences, and those kinds of things.、Uh, but I think most VCs are realizing now that they don't have the The bandwidth, frankly, to play at the very early stage.、Mm -hmm. uh, most VCs that went out, most larger VC funds that then also tried to get in the business of writing hundred thousand dollar checks, two hundred thousand dollar checks, found that that could not scale.、Mm -hmm. uh, so some of them have set up scout programs, and you know we hear about them. They're kind of stealthy. 
Uh, this is a much more scalable, much more open way to do this, something similar, uh, except that the lead angel, rather than having just one VC as a backer, can have multiple people. It's all transparent and open. It's more democratized and it's more scalable. And using our infrastructure, it's much, much easier to manage. And because in most cases there's going to be a number of LPs in each fund, does that minimize signaling risk? That's always a concern, even with the scout yeah. programs. You know, uh, so these sort of mini G general partners on your fund are going to raise uh, you know, back portfolio companies, but when it comes time to raise a Series A, will they be in trouble if Accomplice doesn't want to get involved or Bain doesn't? Yeah, want to you know, signaling risk was something the industry used to talk about a lot a few years ago. I think at this point it's kind of sailed. Everybody knows that uh, not every VC can invest in every deal that they see, right. uh, and lots of good VCs pass on lots of good deals. So I think that has just kind of evaporated somewhat. That said, yes, most of these uh, lead angels actually have multiple LPs, uh, and they're they're not really beholden contractually or anything to show every deal to their VC LPs, uh, but it's more of a relationship and a friendship thing. Okay. Um, and I also was wondering, because we've talked about this over the years since you started Angelist in 2010, 2011, why not do this sooner? It takes an enormous amount of work. It wasn't until 2013 that uh, just the idea of online fundraising was even semi-legal, and then we could do syndicates. And it's only now that we have enough good angels on the platform that are vetted that people feel comfortable backing them in kind of these blind funds, because they're the funds that can invest in almost whatever they want. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on the back end, the LPs and the backers have built up enough interest and enough conviction in the lead angels and the model. So they can see some of the early syndicate deals and how they're doing, and that helps them get conviction to then go and write a blind pool check uh, to these people. Great. Well, back to CSC. I, is it C? Yeah, CSC Group. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about this. I thought it was interesting. This Chinese private equity group um, had gotten behind Angelus last year, and uh, said they wanted to commit $400 million yeah. to the platform. And in fact, I think they did invest something like $50 million last uh, year? Probably closer to 100 at this point. Oh, really? Uh, wow. Yeah, there's been a lot flowing through. Uh, obviously, getting money in and out of China is fits and starts. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Uh, the platform as a whole, though, is balanced out because now we have dozens of family offices. Uh, we have a couple of other larger funds as well. Um, and uh, we, we have, of course, thousands of accredited investors who are backing uh, a lot of the syndicates. So the capital kind of keeps flowing, but uh, it's not all going to come from China. Okay, good. Yeah, I was wondering with those capital yeah. controls they input. Um, okay, so another thing that I thought was interesting was a, another crowdfunding um, marketplace called Theaters mm -hmm. recently announced that this summer it's going to launch a secondary marketplace. Mm -hmm. And I know you are already focused on you know, many mm -hmm. different things, but I thought it could be interesting to see Angelus get into this business. Yes, yeah, Cedar, Cedars is doing uh, crowdfunding, which is not what we do. We, we work on accredited, although we mm -hmm. do have a spin out called Republic that mm -hmm. does do crowdfunding. Uh, the crowdfunding rules in the U.S. are very different than the U.K., where Cedars and others have been successful. Um, we are obviously always looking at secondary marketplaces. The problem is just how much liquidity can you have for these things. Generally, if you have a really well-known company, like a Facebook or a Snapchat before the IPO, there's demand from uh, later stage investors for a secondary marketplace, but it's usually concentrated in a very few names. We work at very, very early stage where, frankly, people don't know the companies. And if somebody wants to sell at such a negative signal, it's not clear there's a buyer on the other side. But we've already done now uh, around 1,500 companies on the platform have raised money online and they've raised over half a billion dollars and they've gone on to raise over five billion dollars. So it's, they're getting larger and larger and larger and there will be a point where some of those names become so hot that there will be secondary demand and then if those companies are open to it, we'll work with them to fill that secondary demand. How many investors are now on the platform and where are, I, I, I sort of still feel like it's kind of largely Silicon Valley based. Yeah. Maybe that's not correct. Uh, yeah, about half our deals are Silicon Valley based, although we uh, do have deals now live in Canada. Um, we have, of course, New York and, uh, and uh, L.A. and Seattle and a couple other hubs in the U.S. Um, we've also been doing deals in Europe for quite a while. Uh, and now we're also working on plans in India uh, to roll things out. And, and you, can, you, you are in India, or that's sort of something that's on the horizon? It's being put together. Okay, because I remember we, we talked a little about that last yeah. summer. It's that regulations are different in every country, so the model has to be different, unfortunately. It's not a cookie-cutter, stamp-out model. Right. Um, I'm also wondering if you would share maybe what you're doing with Product Hunt. So you acquired this company for a reported 20 million in December. Is that report correct? <laughs> uh, I can't say. Uh, but uh, yeah, we acquired Product Hunt. Or uh, Product Hunt is a great team and a great company, and we've been admirers from afar. Uh, and fundamentally, 
we're kind of here to innovate on the infrastructure of innovation. There's so much innovation going on, and there's lots of people who kind of fund that innovation, but there's very little innovation on that in infrastructure for innovation itself. Uh, and so we like to innovate on that infrastructure to help companies and create more tech companies, because I think tech is a universal good uh, for humanity. And so uh, what do tech companies need? They need money, they need talent, and they need customers. Uh, so Angelus started out helping them with raising money. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're the largest startup recruiting marketplace in the world with 25,000 startups recruiting and uh, about a million candidates. And we did over a million introductions last year, wow. uh, mutual matches between talent and uh, startup companies. Um, but the missing piece is helping uh, companies find their early customers. And Product Hunt did an amazing job of that. They've launched 90,000 companies, sorry, 90,000 products now in Product Hunt. Uh, they do millions of product discoveries every single month. Uh, and it's kind of the place where uh, teams from Uber and Facebook and Google and lots and lots of startups go to launch their latest apps. Um, and so we were always just in awe and respect of Product Hunt. And we brought them in to kind of complete the third leg of that triad so we can help companies uh, scale to customers as well. That's great. Now, ultimately, talent and uh, money are just proxies for, getting, for building a product that customers want, right? It's like probably the most important one uh, and the one that we were missing. And so, I mean, it sounds like that could be a revenue-generating product, like an AngelList enterprise. Uh, we'll show you, you know, who you should be talking to. We know what their tech yeah. stacks are. Is that part of the plan? Yeah, I think long-term it can generate revenue. Uh, in the short term, we've left the team completely independent. Um, they're still com executing on the same plans that they were before we uh, merged up. Uh, and uh, all of the management and team is still there. Okay. Um, you know, I, just backstage you were talking to, I don't know if it was the CEO or um, someone else at Republic, mm -hmm. this crowdfunding platform that you'd yeah. gotten involved in last year and I completely missed somehow. So can you yeah. tell us a little bit about that and how involved yeah. you are in it? So the crowdfunding rules are very, very different than raising from accredited. Unfortunately, it's a... It's the way the government sets it up, but the rules completely change in terms of who's allowed on the platform and uh, what kinds of deals you can do and uh, what, uh, what liability is exposed and what kind of stuff those companies have to show and so on. Mm -hmm. But crowdfunding is going to happen. It is happening in the U.S., just moving a little bit slower than the U.K. as they work out the final regs uh, and there's some modifications required to the regs. But even now, companies that have uh, customer bases that they want to share in equity with kind of like Oculus may have wanted to do had this existed in the past, um, or even Uber with its drivers. Um, those companies now have an opportunity to start doing that. Uh, and Republic is a spin out that we did um, with uh, some of our best people to go and start doing that. Uh, it's still very early. Republic's done a couple of deals. Um, but I think we're sort of in the first inning of crowdfunding. OK. And I guess what is your stance on um, maybe loosening or broadening the definition of accredited investor? Because I think, at least in the past, you were kind of concerned about this. You, you sort of, I, I think, had thought that startup investing should be sort of left to more sophisticated investors. Yeah, I, don't, I think the accreditation thing is sort of a guideline left over from the 1930s uh, Act, the 1934 Securities Law Act. Uh, and it's, it kind of tries to apply broadly to all investment categories. Mm -hmm. uh, the reality is I think what matters much more is sophistication than accreditation. Having a million dollar net worth doesn't make you a genius and having less than a million dollar net worth doesn't make you a fool. Uh, so I think it's much more about the sophistication. Like people in this audience understand the tech business. Uh, they can probably get up to speed with the right resources and are sophisticated enough to invest in tech companies. There are other people who are very accredited and very wealthy who don't have the sophistication mm -hmm. and frankly should be going through a diversified basket fund or something of the sort. Like we, we offer these diversified funds on AngelList and that's how we actually think most investors should be investing rather than trying to pick individual deals or even syndicates. Uh, but I think it's a sophistication thing. So we run sophistication tests on the platform on top of accreditation. But yeah, accreditation is a little bit of an anachronism. Uh, but it's not going to change because you know, it's baked in regulatory law and it applies to so many different financial products and industries. Yeah, I think it'll take some time certainly if it does ever change. Um, so before we move on to recruiting, which is an even bigger part of your business, I did want to talk to you. So when I sat down with you at your uh, new, very nice new offices uh, in August, um, you, had, it was, you were telling me that uh, you were going to make the deals private, and yeah. you had good reasons for this. Um, but I do sometimes wonder if you're moving more in the direction of a lack of transparency. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, no, it's fair. We do worry about that. Mm -hmm. uh, the reality is the, our first and foremost for investors in the platform is they have to make money. Mm -hmm. And to make money, they have to be in good deals. It can't be adverse selection. You can't have great companies staying off the platform because they're worried about information leakage. So we did have to take the deals private by default. 
Uh, the Can syndicates. Take a liquidity hit for that? Uh, not really. I mean, that was part of the reason why we felt it was safe to do. Uh, because really, when people invest in a company on AngelList, it's because they believe in the lead angel who's backing it. Uh, they're they're not really cross pollinating. So if if someone doesn't know me as the lead, they're not going to necessarily follow me uh, unless they kind of had a pre existing relationship or had done their homework on me. So I think taking it private helps with quality, uh, fights adverse selection, uh, and makes the companies feel more secure. Um, but you're right in that it's not kind of this ideal transparency marketplace of uh, everything being put up all the time. Uh, but I, I do still think that slowly over time, companies will re re relax those constraints, especially later stage companies. Um, you're seeing this a little bit in like ICOs, you know, initial coin offerings, like the whole blockchain space, where people are now slapping coins onto their companies and trying to use that as a mechanism to sort of some of the, some of them are very legit. They're like new protocols being built where they're issuing tokens, but in other cases, it's just a bypass of existing securities law. Uh, those companies are pretty transparent, right? They're putting everything out there. Wow. Um, so th yeah, that, that's the wild west of fundraising right now. Um, but I guess you know, not to dwell too long on this, but I was thinking. You know, unless you have ties to, I mean, it's great because I'm sure it makes your base much more loyal to you uh, because of the, the, the deal uh, quality is higher. But does it mean that people who don't have ties to like top angel investors, you know, startups or investors, it seems now that it's not as useful for them because they, or am I misunderstanding how it works? No, I, I mean, I, th I think the platform as a whole is really useful for the companies, even if they don't want to raise money. Um, or if they do raise money on the platform, it helps them with recruiting. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're recruiting on the platform, it helps your reputation, it helps you with product hunt. If you launch a product on the platform, it helps you with your uh, reputation for fundraising and for recruiting. So it's kind of the whole thing works together. It's just with venture fundraising, you just have to acknowledge that a lot of companies still want to be very private. Right. Um, so it's private by default, but a company can always be more open. They can always choose to say, look, we're launched, we have traction, we have nothing to hide, we're open to all investors, but that's not the default. Okay, great. So tell me a little bit about recruiting. I mean, you've, you've given us some stats, um, but you know, what, what's the sort of the latest there? Yeah, so uh, we run this large free recruiting platform. Uh, 25,000 companies are actively recruiting on there. About a million candidates all across the world. It's very active even in uh, London and Bangalore and even parts of South America. Um, we have uh, made, uh, we, we make about 100,000 introductions every month, and by introductions, these are mutual. So the candidate wants to meet the company, the company wants to meet the candidate. Uh, it's a direct match marketplace, there's no middlemen, there's no one's getting spammed, hopefully. Uh, or we crack down on that. Uh, and all the data is there for you to see. So you see the company's profile, you see how much they're offering in salary, equity, who your coworkers would end up being, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we've also rolled out Track, which is, uh, we just got frustrated with the state of the application tracking system market out there. Most of the ATSs are just built for larger heavyweight companies. And we want something lightweight, simple, cool. Um, so we built our own tracking system. It's just at angel.co slash track. It's free. Uh, and it's a great way to kind of track uh, everyone in your pipeline, going through the interview process, et cetera. Um, so that's a, that's a product we worked on. And then we also have A-List, which we're still very early, but uh, that's our premium recruiting service. So if you have more money than time uh, for $10,000 per hired developer or designer, uh, we'll take the best developer and designers in the platform, expose them to your company, make sure they're paying attention, and kind of do more white glove service to help connect you. Which is so smart. And, and do you expect that most of your revenue is going to come from that service or? Yeah, it, I mean, the revenue is going to come, the short term revenue will probably come from recruiting. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it will come from A list, some of it might come from other products that we're working on. Uh, you know, we also just have a ton of data. So all these people active on the platform and all the data is tagged. So we, for example, we know Harvard grads are applying to company X or uh, you know, these three companies in the same space are trying to recruit these kinds of people. One's paying more, one's paying less, one seems to be ramping up hiring, one seems to be slowing down hiring. So all of this data can be actually incredibly useful for hiring managers uh, and for the candidates. Um, so we are looking at ways to an anonymize, aggregate, make that data useful, and then expose it back to the community. And that's something we could also potentially make money for down the line. But we, we keep the team pretty lean. I mean, right now the company's around 60 people. It's 20 people in fundraising, 20 people in recruiting, and 20 people in product hunt is a kind of a glib way to uh, divide it up. It's sort of astonishing given your sort of outsized uh, footprint. But are you profitable? Not yet. Not yet, OK. But it's the plan. <laughs> <laughs> um, and 
But by the way, profitability is really hard, right? It takes years to work at it. Like when I think of that Silicon Valley, the number of companies that are created every year uh, in the tech industry that create a brand new product the world has never seen before, and then figure out how to monetize it, you can count them on two hands every year. So there's just a you know getting getting to profitability is a huge objective for us because we want AngelList to be self-sustaining. It's not the kind of thing where we wanted to have to seek an, uh, an unnatural exit. Um, and we'll get there. That's part of the reason why we kept the team so lean. We have 18 seconds. What is a natural exit? Is it an IPO? What is the exit? I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think that far ahead about it, to be honest. I consider that a lot of financial engineering. I know that's important for VCs and investors. Uh, but uh, we can always just make it into a cash business. Uh, we're set up as an LLC because we do a lot of fund management and a lot of our uh, because on fundraising we get paid in carry which is profits in the f uh, on future uh, on investments that pays out far in the future mm -hmm. um, So because of that we're structured a little bit more like a traditional VC fund in that we're set up as an LLC um, But if we do an IPO, you know, I'd rather do it in our own market, which is still a little ways out Interesting. Thank you so much Naval. Always so nice to see you. Thank you for having me. Take care. Thanks everybody